All right, looks like everyone who um, was waiting is now in. So thank you so much for your patience in this process. Um, my name is Rebecca Luber and I'm the Director of Career and Business Engagement with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Our Ask a Recruiter Networking and Job Search Strategies is the, is the second in a three-part series presented by Avenica. Avenica is an innovative education to work platform focused on bridging the skills gap to connect more people to better career opportunities. Unlike traditional employment agencies for college graduates, Avenica provides high impact training, a comprehensive career discovery process, and personalized coaching, helping thousands of people launch meaningful careers. All right. So before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to thank our Alumni Association members and donors for their support. To learn more about supporting the Alumni Association, you may go to umenalumni.org slash membership. So this program is uh, one of many in our career months programming. As you can see here on the screen, we have Ask Recruiter interviewing next up. Then we have a number of other programs that you may be interested in, including our signature event, the Maroon and Gold Connections event, which is a networking event for all students and alumni to connect. To learn more about, the, about this and other programs, you may go to umnalumni.org slash career month. All right. Career Month is made possible by many great partners that are shown on your screen here. Our presenting sponsor, Freedom Financial, is a proud, is proud to sponsor Career Month because quality education and career development align with their mission to help everyday people move forward towards a better financial future. Their suite of financial solutions has helped hundreds of thousands of consumers take control of their finances, reduce their debt, and get, a, get on a path to financial freedom since 2002. UMAA greatly appreciates our partners who have made these events possible. Thank you so much. All right, so if you're listening in today, to make the best out of your experience, you may select the speaker view at the top uh, right-hand corner. Um, so you can um, see who's speaking at, at when um, the person has is the main speaker. And today, we're since we're in Zoom meeting format, you'll be entering your questions into the chat function. And for that, um, you can enter your questions in the chat function or you can raise your hand and at that time, we will call on you and you have the opportunity to turn your video on if you wish to do so. Okay. And um, to be, we'll get started by introducing our, our moderator and I'll turn it over to Erica. Hello everyone, good afternoon or at whatever time it is, wherever you're calling in and zooming in from. My name is Erica Teeley. I am a senior career counselor in CLA Career Services and I'm also a proud alum of the university for both my undergrad and graduate degree. And I'm excited here to moderate this panel and I will let each of them uh, introduce themselves. So let's start with Julia. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Corder. I am a graduate of the University of Minnesota where I was on the women's tennis team. Graduated in 2015 and finished my master's from there in 2016. Currently I'm a campus recruiter at Northwestern Mutual. Super excited to be here today. And Lauren? You bet. So I am not an alumni. However, I am surrounded by alumni. I'm the only one in my entire family that didn't go to the U of M. Um, but I am so proud to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, I serve as Vice President of Growth Strategy for Avenica. We are a Twin Cities-based organization. You probably already heard a little snapshot about what we do. But I'm really excited to be here at my organization. I lead uh, marketing, brand, and also um, partnerships. So university partnerships are encompassing of that. Thank you, Lauren and Julia. And as a note, we are uh, expecting a third panelist, but as we have all found out in the last year, technology glitches are oftentimes real. So hopefully she will be able to join us sooner rather than later. And now for a poll question. So as the panelists are answering the questions we prepared for today that they can specifically speak to what you're hoping to get. So what do you hope to gain from today's conversation? So please answer in the survey that just should have popped up on your screen.
Okay, so it looks pretty even, but the top one sounds like we'll learn more about what recruiters look for. So you all are in love with both of our lovely panelists today. And again, networking, which seemed fairly reflective on the questions you submitted when you registered, and then those application materials. Great. Okay, well, let's get started. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted what recruiting looks like um, and are your companies still hiring? First, Julie. Oh, yeah, oh, Julie. Ahead, Lauren. Yeah, you go first. Okay. Um, man, oh man. Yes, companies are still recruiting. Absolutely, they're still hiring. I think what is um, kind of interesting is some companies are hiring more than others did before because COVID has impacted different companies and organizations in different ways. Some have actually experienced growth. Um, and all of that combined with the fantastic thing that is retirements on the horizon, a number of industries have been more impacted than others in that regard as well. So it's kind of the sweet spot of some openings um, into to roles that have been previously held by folks who are now starting to retire out. So obviously, I would also say that the way in which people are interviewing and how we are getting to know candidates coming through our own process and others um, from employer's perspective has changed as we've all gone virtual. But yes, they are definitely still, still hiring. I would definitely echo everything Lauren said as well as, you know, us as an organization, actually last year, um, we did have a record breaking year as far as growth within our organization. And also um, just in the industry, we had a record breaking year with sales as well. So we're definitely still hiring. Um, and I know talking with other um, companies across the, you know, across the United States, they're definitely still hiring as well in different capacities. And as Lauren said, we're all going virtual, um, which we've learned is also a tool that we can use by going virtual and hosting um, more meetings, more work events, and being able to really connect with people across the United States with this virtual tool for sure. Great, thank you. And I hope you all are heartened to hear that as well. Um, second question, what are growing or shifting trends in types of employment as a result of COVID-19? And I know Julia, you just spoke to technology. Lauren, what else could you add to that? So, I, and I know um, Jenny was gonna speak to this a bit, but contract work has definitely seen an uptick. Um, a number of companies who were financially impacted by COVID 19 have decided to move toward more project-based contract work situations that allow them to kind of manage their, um, their pocketbook a little bit more effectively, efficiently based off of how they're performing. So um, I would say contract work has definitely seen a spike. We tend to focus more solely on career full-time type roles. Um, so we're seeing a, a bit different in, um, you know, a lot of candidates that would traditionally be coming in for um, more face-to-face -face, in-person type roles. We're seeing a lot more IT. We're seeing a lot more, um, you know, of those skills being needed as well. So working on upskilling, getting people more comfortable with a number of different tools is part of what we do as well. Nice. Yeah. So it sounds like you train up to a certain extent, which mm -hmm. I know that was part of the submissions of the questions as well as people looking at transitioning and whatnot. Nice. Julia? Yeah, and for us, we do have a lot of career changers within our organization as well. Um, individuals who are super successful in a different field with translat translatable skills into financial advising with us or a different spot within our organization. So really bridging that gap, what you skills that you have and those translatable skills into our organization as a whole and finding a good spot for you too. Um, so definitely for us, we are growing and we're kind of shifting into a lot of career changers who were successful in another career and have learned that, you know, maybe they want the ability to kind of almost run your own business, your own small business and own your own little branch of um, financial advising. So we definitely see a lot of career changers who are very successful. Okay. Thank you. Can you share some stories of successful networking and job strategies that you have witnessed? Yeah, so um, I can start on this one. It's always interesting to me because I know in looking at the participants who are here, it's a broad range of individuals who are fresh out of school, also some of those who are kind of looking for that encore career and those in, everywhere in between as well. And, and looking at some of the faces here, um, I'm really excited to see um, you know, some diversity in terms of age and, and where you're at. So I would say, um, you know, I've worked with a number of individuals more personally recently that are reaching out that are further along, you know, down the path and they're looking to switch it up. 
and I've on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, which is kind of the most common, I would say, social network for uh, reaching out and networking and just asking for advice. And, you know, through those connections and understanding that that person is interested in exploring other opportunities, I've been able to open the doors up for them uh, personally, whether it be through Venica or through other opportunities. So I think it's important for anyone who's interested in making a change, whether that be as an entry level, you know, looking at what your degree might be and you're saying, eh, I'm a little bit more analytical than maybe this communications route that I had planned or vice versa. Um, or maybe you're further down in your career and looking for a change. It's always good to let people know in your you know, warm circle that you're interested in something different because it's not until they understand that you are, that you'll be able to find something else. And so I've done that with a number of folks recently who are um, you know, upward, upper thirties who are now starting to either, they were stay-at-home parents or they're trying to get back into it now. And they're just like, where do I go? What do I do now? So I think the first step is really helping your warm circle and network understand that you are looking so that those people can be your advocates. So you can have those door openers and you can have people um, really thinking about you when it comes to opportunities that they might see as well. So definitely a, a number of success stories in that regard. Um, and of course, in what we do every day at kind of that entry level hire, regardless of age, regardless of whatnot, we are working with individuals every day who are looking to make a change or who are looking to get into an industry where they don't have a door opener. So that's kind of our sweet spot. Perfect. Yeah. And so also I, I've had some success stories this year. Um, I know just in the past couple of months of individuals who actually reached out to me um, and they weren't really looking for a change. They just wanted to hear a little bit more about what we did at Northwestern Mutual and just kind of connect and network. Um, and then getting to talk with them and introducing them to other individuals within our organization. Um, I know one person that I'm thinking of, uh, we hadn't talked in about six years, reached out to me on social media. We got together introduced him to another person and he's actually joining our organization in March, which is really awesome. And he didn't even know he was looking for something. Um, and I know just from talking with networks to um, somebody who I'm super close with who just joined our organization on February 1st um, is actually one of my fiance's best friends. Another one of my coworkers reached out to him and asked if he was looking for something. And actually now he's joined our organization on February 1st. So as Lauren said, just using your network and really um, talking to everybody that's in your network and you never know who might be able to make a connection for you. So reaching out to those individuals, reaching out to people, um, you know, maybe you don't know them super well, um, but just reaching out to them and asking if they'd be open to a virtual coffee or um, to just to talk to you a little bit further because People, people are definitely open to a little bit more networking. And I think a lot of people are craving just some social interactions too. So they definitely wanna to talk to you as well. Thank you. And I'm sure you presented networking so lovely, but I think there's a lot of people who still hear that word and freeze up or kind of think, yeah, but. <laughs> so what advice do you have for people who are still not convinced or what are some suggestions or tools that they can use to feel more comfortable with networking? Sure. So there's a number of different ways that people network. Obviously, COVID has impacted that pretty significantly, but I almost think that COVID has provided um, other folks with another opportunity that may have more hesitancy in person to work with someone or sit down with someone in a coffee shop or whatnot. The virtual environment can be more comforting for some folks. And so it has been helpful in that regard to have this normalcy created around virtual networking. So networking can consist of and can include a variety of different um, you know, aspects of networking. It can be virtual through things like this, through reaching out to someone you know, or reaching out to someone who maybe was a coworker or connection of yours eons ago. You know, it could have been a long time ago. What that looks like is really different depending upon the platform. So it's looking at uh, LinkedIn, of course, is, is kind of the number one. And honestly, the great thing about LinkedIn people expect to be reached out to there. So it's not like you are being an inconvenience for people. You, um, you know, it's expected that folks are going to be reaching out because that is the purpose of the platform is to connect and to provide career advice um, and really be focused on that professional development type activity. So I think that LinkedIn is a great, very natural resource, but I definitely would suggest leveraging other resources as well. So if you're part of, um, you know, community organizations, uh, your church group, uh, it can be 
pick up at, you know, pick up at your school, your kid's school. That's where I do a lot of networking mm -hmm. oftentimes and have in the past. Um, that's where you start up those conversations and they can be just very simple, but growing connections in general will create that warm circle that you have. And there are a number of, of course, tools that are more, um, focused on roles such as LinkedIn, such as just general cold emails. But I would say starting with that warm circle is always a bit more um, intentional and it just tends to lead to much quicker results. So um, I always steer people toward social media platforms, especially if you have a tendency of being a little bit less um, interested in doing more in-person, especially right now. Those are easier ways to kind of dip your toe in and get access to a, a wider variety of individuals and start to really focus on um, making those connections uh, authentically. Yes, I like what you said about the pickup because I just heard an alum speak the other week. She's a digital nomad and, and gets her all her own business. And she said she's gotten more business at train stations and bus stops than anywhere. So it doesn't have to be this formalized process and sometimes informal can make you feel more comfortable presenting yourself. Julia, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, I would echo everything that Lauren said as well, just, um, you know, reaching out to people. I think all of you have taken the first step in networking by just signing up for a networking series and getting, you know, utilizing some resources that you have from the University of Minnesota and getting out there. Um, so just utilizing people that are within these calls, um, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, just using any sort of social media that you do have to reach just a wider audience than maybe you will just run into as well. Um, so everything Lauren said was awesome. Great. And then what is your best advice for job applicants? Ooh, um, you know, I think this is a, this is a big one. This is a big question. I think personally, um, and I think many people would echo, it really does get down to who, you know, it really is about who is, you know, introducing you to an opportunity or to a hiring manager or to a decision maker when it comes down to it. And so we realize uh, at Avenica that not everybody has access to those decision makers or, you know, or whatnot. So we really work to advocate on behalf of our candidates so that we can make those connections for them. Um, so that's really kind of our, our niche. But I would say the biggest thing to consider is, you know, drawing upon our, our previous question, networking and getting to know people and advocating for yourself. I think the biggest thing that you can do in your job search is once you find something, that interests you, that sparks something inside you and you've decided that this is your career route, this is what you wanna do as a next step, um, is really doing your research on that company. Mm -hmm. Go out on LinkedIn, go to their website, understand who their leadership is, and then start kind of breaking it down and thinking about who, what connections do I have that could connect me to someone else here? Is it, you know, through LinkedIn is a great tool. So you go on LinkedIn, you're gonna look at that company, you can actually sort by people. And if you have first, second or third de uh, degree connections, you can then sort by who can introduce me to this person and this person and this person. And you continue to get those warm leads, which really helps to uh, not only solidify trust when it comes to a, a relationship, but you're really getting a referral uh, to mm -hmm. a partnership based off of trust. And I will tell you that you will move to the, stop, the top of the pile and stack whenever you have a personal recommendation from someone else that is a warm lead or someone who understands who you are as well. So um, getting back to that notion of, it is, a lot of it is about who you know and how you set yourself apart. So um, leveraging the resources that you have is really important. Yeah, I would say too for us, uh, favorable introductions is like what we like to call them. So doing a search on LinkedIn, seeing those second or third connections and then asking for a favorable introduction of some sort saying, hey, I see that, you know, um, Lauren, is there a way that you could introduce me, Erica? Um, and people will definitely be willing to introduce you. Um, the next thing is, is doing your research is huge. Um, knowing about the company, knowing what they do, um, really making sure that that would drive you and make you passionate about your work you're doing and the organization as a whole. Um, I love talking to candidates when they're very passionate about things that we do within, the, within our company, within the community, and making sure that that ties into their personal passions and life as well. So really making sure you're doing your research with that too. 
Okay, thank you both for all of that. And I see that there's hands raised, there's lots of questions in the chat. So I will hand it back over to Rebecca to start calling on people and to read off these questions for you to answer. Great, thank you so much, Erica, and uh, for moderating our panel. And we'll get to some of the questions as you mentioned. Um, I see here one of the first persons to raise their hand was Nils Weldon who also popped their question into the chat, but I, I wanna give him opportunity to um, ask his question on camera. So I will um, ask Nils to unmute himself or themselves, and then I'll lower their hand. And so Nils, you're welcome to, yes, use your camera and go ahead, ask your question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Nels Wadeen. Um, so my question is related to what we're talking about now. If, if someone I know a first person connection makes this connection introduction to someone they know who is in a company I'm interested in or is in a role that I'm interested in. Uh, what do I do next? You know, how do I reach out? What's the first thing to say? Should mm -hmm. I ask for an informational interview or how do I actually like leverage that introduction to work? That's a great, great question, Nels. I think, and thank you. I think that um, that's that's a million dollar question a lot of people have is like, what do I do next? What's the next step, right? And you've already gotten the warm intro. That's a huge piece of the puzzle. So what, what comes next is developing that relationship. It's understanding that person. And it can be an informational interview. It can also just be, can you, do you want to grab virtual coffee? Let's talk about you know, what this role is. Let's talk about what your organization is like. And um, I also think it's important to, to just share upfront that so-and-so connected you to so-and-so because, and understand the justification for why you're reaching out. I'm interested in this role because X, Y, Z. So leveraging that connection that you've made is really important. And I would also suggest one thing that we find out, um, we find a lot, and I've found a lot is, People will reach out to me for an introduction to someone else, and then that's it. And then I don't hear about it afterwards. So make sure mm -hmm. that you're leveraging and continuing to provide feedback to the person who ultimately made that introduction so that you can foster that relationship too, because obviously it takes time for them as well. So what one thing that I've done is uh, thrown them a $5 Starbucks gift card if I'm looking for uh, an introduction to someone is just kind of a thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but fostering that relationship and making sure that that their time, uh, that you're using your time, getting your questions asked of them and helping them see that you are a good fit for the company, seeing your values, understanding who you are as a person and showing that you're really interested is really important. So leveraging that time and, and doing some prep work around, uh, to Julia's point, research, understanding a little bit more about the role. So you have some really thoughtful questions going into it would be important. Excellent. Thank you so much. And it looks like the next question we have here is about career gaps. Um, the question here is from Kelly and she's asking, or they're asking, what about a five-year career gap due to caregiving and an accident? How do you convince the recruiter that you still remember your career, career and that your skills are, are, are still up to date? Yeah, I would say um, that definitely goes back to just doing your research about the organization and being passionate about what the organization has. I think when you're talking to a recruiter or the hiring manager for um, any spot, you can really show how passionate you are about the position by doing research before, um, making sure that you know a lot about the company as well and talking just about um, really what makes you a good fit for the position. Um, I would say just be as confident as you can be. Um, and I think confident, in with having confidence comes preparation. So as long as you're prepared before the conversation and you're prepared for it, you're definitely gonna have confidence going in. And I would add to that also, you know, I think that part of the root of that question is how do I overcome this five-year gap on my resume and, or whatever it might be. And I'll be honest, I think more and more people are, are in hiring managers that we've spoken with are understanding of, of some of those things. There's a lot of people going back to work after having children and whatnot. And we've been having those conversations a lot uh, with our employers as well and our client partners to say, this is normal, right? I mean, people make transitions, people make changes all the time. So it's important to not only research the company, but also take a step back and understand what are your transferable skills. If you are a caregiver, 
That means managing a million things. That means organization. That means taking a, a, a you know an understanding and an inventory of all the different pieces of the puzzle that you're holding together in that capacity. Um, and being able to share real life examples through the interview process if you get to that point is really important. But then we're just gonna hit back on that a question or the, that we had earlier, which is that warm introductions. You know, if you do have a significant gap, make sure that you're overcoming some of those challenges and, and getting that interview by forming some more of those warm relationships and helping those individuals who are providing an introduction understand why you have mm -hmm. a gap in that time. And you know, nine times out of 10, they're all gonna say, totally understand, we understand, I'm gonna advocate for you because I know that you're the right person for the role. Great, looks like we have a question here about LinkedIn. How can you network on LinkedIn without giving your current employer, um, without letting your current employer uh, become aware that you're networking on LinkedIn? Um, yeah. Sure, I can take this too. Um, so LinkedIn is a, a special tool in that it does allow you the function and the feature to say, I'm looking, right? But to your point, your own HR team could also see that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I would say that private messages are the best way to kind of form those. And if you're currently in a situation where you are employed, um, leveraging your personal emails, you know, if you're going to reach out to someone via LinkedIn Messenger or whatnot, to say, hey, you know what? I'm currently employed, but I'm actually looking for, for something a bit different. Could you share with me something about your role or the company or whatnot? And provide to them your personal email so that you're not having that you know, conflict of interest and you're doing it outside of work hours is really important. Um, and not only because it's important for your current employer, but it's also important for them to see that you are going to respect your future employer when you're on the job with them as well. So there's kind of that etiquette when it comes to um, when you're doing some of that networking outside of business hours as well. All right. Looks like there's a question here, and I'm not sure we'll have all the answers on this, but this is a good question. Um, given that we tend to network with people who are like us, how do we ensure that we are not excluding people from our circles based on protected classes and protect, protect ourselves from similar exclusion? Um, I think this question gets, gets at, like sometimes our network can be, uh, can, um, is limited to those who are like us education-wise, class-wise, um, different identities and so forth. And I think here, this is a good question about, you know, how do you get out and branch out from that and ensure that you're being inclusive and networking with others outside of your own shared identities? Um, and I think my, 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 my response to this would be thinking about uh, different opportunities in your community that you can get involved with, different mm -hmm. associations, different um, sort of meetup groups. There's a meetup.com. So exposing yourself to different groups and different settings and situations where you are networking with folks who are outside of your immediate community. Um, I'm not sure if Lauren or Julie wants to add to this, but um, those are some, some of the, the suggestions I have there. Yeah, I would say um, definitely everything you said, Rebecca, just trying to push yourself outside of individuals who are very similar to you would be um, getting involved with the community and really getting yourself outside of what you would typically say like, oh, this is very much so me, I'm gonna join this. Um, but seeing some other organizations that kind of um, would push yourself outside of those uh, typical groups that you would join. Um, going to some of those maybe networking events that you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, I, you know, maybe this would be something new for me. This would be something um, that I could learn something more. Um, so I would say anytime you can push yourself outside of those comfort zones to do some more networking is an awesome opportunity to learn more. Excellent. There's a question here. What is the etiquette for reaching out to people on LinkedIn? And how should we connect with professionals who we want to reach out to? So thinking about like, how, how do we make that initial ask? Like, what do we say? How do we navigate that? So sure, I can take this one. Um, you know, once you hit a certain title on, <laughs> on LinkedIn, you there's an extra you're going to get reached out to more frequently than others. Um, and especially if you are engaging as a leader out there. So I always just want to preface that never feel awkward reaching out to a leader on LinkedIn, because again, that's the purpose of that platform, right? 
Um, but in terms of etiquette, I think it's always important that you, again, lay out the foundation of understanding why. Why are you reaching out to this person? Because their time is precious. It's valuable. It's important. And it, it, you know, it takes a lot of time to go through the LinkedIn messages and making sure that you're adding value and helping people as well. So I would say be intentional with what the message is. Don't make it too long. It's, you know, I'm looking to um, connect with you to learn a little bit more about XYZ position, XYZ or uh, opportunity or organization or whatnot, or if there's a shared combined interest. So for example, on my LinkedIn profile, I definitely spun it a little bit different. It's, it's a little bit more fun and upbeat than a very like lockdown black and white um, type uh, profile. But I did that because I think it allows people to relate a bit differently. So if you find something on their LinkedIn profile that relates to you or that you find is interesting or intriguing, ask questions about that versus, you know, I just want to roll this company and I saw that you're a decision maker. It's hey, I checked out your profile and I saw this, this, and this. I thought that's really interesting. I have these things in common, whatever that might look like and keep it really conversational. I cannot tell you how many times we get reached out to um, about sales opportunities or whatever it might be. So if you can rise above all of that noise, you're already gonna be in a good spot. Excellent. The next question here um, is about translating what they're looking for. It's, the question is, I've asked friends and coworkers that I'm looking, um, that I'm looking for a job and to let them know if they, there are any openings. Um, but most of the time it's out of sight, out of mind. When they ask what type of job I'm looking for, I'm pretty open. So, and they may not understand what kind of role I'm currently doing to connect the dots with the job that they might want. Um, so any kind of suggestions for helping to translate some of their interests and skills um, to, their, to their friends and coworkers to help them better understand what they're looking for? I've got some ideas um, I can share and then Julia uh, mm -hmm. as well, for sure. So I, um, one exercise that I like to do with some mentees is actually, um, it, it's, it's on paper. So I'm very old school, let me tell you. <laughs> but um, I actually like to put kind of two columns. So I have people write on their personal life. What are some of the activities and things and hobbies and whatnot they enjoy doing? And then on the other side and their professional life, what are some of the things, activities, um, job duties, roles, responsibilities that they've enjoyed doing in the past? And then what we do is we kind of cross-reference, right? So we're going to look through that sheet and we're going to say, okay, these are some of the commonalities. These are some of the cross-sections between these two lists. So for me, for example, I love photography. And part of the reason I love photography is because I love taking something from a, a raw image and editing it and seeing something on the other, other side. On the other side of it, I love working through strategy. So I've led strategies. That's, that's kind of my background. And so that cross-connection cross is problem solving. You know, when you think about puzzles and all the different things that come into that problem solving is at the root of what I enjoy doing. So if you can define that, and if you can get to a point where you have an elevator pitch, right? So just a short 30 second pitch about what you're talking about uh, and what you're looking for and what ultimately drives you um, to a particular role or something that would be simple, you know, simplified in that manner of, I like problem solving, I like whatnot, and I'm not necessarily focused on one particular industry. I wanna do this, this, and this then you're already going to be in a better situation to be able to provide that to someone who's going to work on your behalf. So being able to advocate for yourself in meaningful terms that can be transferable um, mm -hmm. skills and that really represent who you are will help them advocate for you in a quick and concise way later on. Right. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Just talking about writing down, um, taking some time to like use a pen and paper and figure out exactly what you're passionate about too. Um, for me, when I'm trying to think too, so I made a career switch from, you know, college athletics to campus recruiting and trying to figure out what I liked about my current role and what I would like to see in a future role. So trying to explain to individuals like what I really wanted to do. Um, and I, you know, I took a pen and paper and wrote down what I was passionate about personally, um, what I felt like really made me excited and what I would like to see a little bit more in a career. So I think just spending some time figuring out what you really like. Um, as I said before, figuring out what you're passionate about, figuring out what companies would align with that. Maybe you don't know the exact role, but as you're talking about things that you're passionate about, when you're talking to individuals within your network, they would be like, oh, this is perfect for you. Um, so really having an understanding of what you like to do and what you're passionate about, I think is the first step. Um, and then you can talk to people about um, what you would like to see in a role and then they can piece it together for you. I don't think you need to have the exact role that you want. 
Um, it's awesome if you do, but I don't know many people who do. So, um, but knowing what you're passionate about and what you want to um, and what you like to do, I think is really important is the first step for sure. Hey, thank you. There's a question here about transition. So the person here, they're looking to transition from a medical career, medical career to writing. Do you have resources for testing personality quizzes after you test to see my strengths? I'm not sure how to find a company or group that I should be searching. Um, yes, yeah, so I have a response for this one. So uh, career assessments are often uh, tools to help you understand your interests, skills, and abilities. They do not help you identify a specific career path or tell you what, what you will do or could do, um, but they are helpful to understanding more about some of the interest, skills, abilities, values that we discussed today. And so you may want to look into Strengths Finder or the Myers Briggs, um, Myers Briggs or MBTI rather. Um, those are two tools that you can look at into, and then there's also those strong interest inventory. Um, those you can probably look look those up, and you can probably find a career coach who does independent uh, consulting to to help uh, provide those assessments to you, and then deliver a debrief. Um, so oftentimes you want to work with someone in a one on one capacity when doing those assessments. Sometimes you can find these um, some versions of these online, but mm -hmm. having the context that a career coach could provide in the debrief, um, it's hard to tell, um, it's hard to get the most out of that experience. Yeah, and we actually do something like this at Avenica. We have a program called Avenica Pathways, which we work with um, students from you know, a number of different organizations who have sponsored them to come through this through the dream.us. We have a partnership with KIPP. We have a partnership with a number of large employers, including MPCC as well. Um, and so what happens that that assessment uh, is a behavioral based assessment and skills inventory and then kind of guide them through on a one on one coaching opportunity. So I'm happy to, to provide some additional information about that on the side. Um, but I just want to echo what Rebecca had mentioned working one on one with someone is so important. So, you know, you can take all the, the assessments and personality quizzes online that you want and find your Enneagram and whatnot. Um, but it's really important to make sure that you do find someone who's going to have a bit more skill in that understanding and identifying what your unique aspects of your personality and your uh, strengths are when you're really looking to make a, a larger transition from a career or even just your first step into a career. And so that's really uh, what we do at Avenica is, is looking at the whole person going beyond a resume. So not saying you're a business major, you're gonna go into this finance position. It's no, you're a business major, that's great, but what do you wanna do? And how can we get you to the place you wanna be? And we also offer um, a similar test as well, or uh, it's called our culture index survey. So um, if anyone's interested in taking that, it does only take like five to seven minutes, then I can send you your results as well. Um, but we use it as a tool in our office, um, not as a test, but just as a, um, a way to just kind of pair you up with people in the office who are similar to you um, when we're doing joint work, mentorship and other things. So it's definitely a five to seven minute self-assessment and um, it's just a little tool to learn a little bit more about yourself. Great. So as next question I'm gonna ask um, is, is about applicant tracking systems, which is a really common question we've been receiving. Uh, so does your company use applicant tracking systems? What are the logistics behind that? What do you look for? And what from a hiring perspective is using that system like? So I can take that. I've done a bit of research on um, Bayes' theorem, which for those who are not familiar with Bayes' theorem is essentially taking past uh, indicators and leveraging them for future outcomes and kind of ranking people based off of that. And that is what I would say a majority of organizations who are leveraging systems like this are using. So they're, they're taking keywords out of your resume um, and understanding based off of your past what your future can look like. So um, I'll be the first to say that at, at Avenica, we don't believe in that. <laughs> so we're a much more personalized approach when it comes to understanding again that whole person and where they wanna be in terms of their hopes, dreams, desires, um, and ways that we can upscale and strengthen as well when it comes to that junior level talent. Um, and so, you know, there are many of uh, many companies that do leverage that, but most of the clients that we work with come to us because we know that whole person is going to create a better retention within that organization or is going to have better retention because they're the right fit from a culture perspective, from an mm -hmm. upward mobility perspective, et cetera. And I honestly think that more and more companies as we're talking to them 
are thinking more deeply about this and saying, you know what, actually that's right. We can't use past indicators to predict future outcomes, um, which is what Bayes theorem is all about. So um, to answer the question in a, a very long way, yes, we're very familiar with it. No, we don't believe in it. Um, we're much more personalized in a one-to-one -one, one -one approach, um, but how to get around those, it's gonna be tricky. And again, it's just who you know or working with an organization like Avenica to advocate on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Great. So look